<laughs> Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, good. Um, I'm hoping a slide will appear. I was told by a young lady who's been trying to get me to the airport since, ah, since I was here that uh, she was going to give me a slide automatically. So my background is I'm a physician who sees people with diabetes a lot of the time, and I run a research lab as well uh, up at UCLA. And the bias of our work is that we um, recognize that not all humans are same, the same as mice. So we try to work particularly with humans. And uh, I made a tactical um, a good move in this regard early on in my career because I married a, a pathologist. Um, she also gave me my green card so I could stay here. Uh, and after 30 years, we're still married. So it wasn't really just for convenience. Um, so this diagram here shows you the human pancreas. And it's a very inconvenient organ for those of us uh, trying to do research, as well as for those of you perhaps who have the need for replacement. The pancreas is on the backbone and consists mostly of cells making the digestive juices that are taking care of your, your sandwich right now. And about 1% of the um, <coughs> organ is composed of these islets of Langerhans, named after the German medical student who found them for his research project, um, sadly died as a consequence because he caught tuberculosis doing the dissections. And these islets of Langerhans are about 1 million in number. And during the course of the presentations today, you've heard about uh, how they arise and how they develop. In the course of uh, uh, human childhood, um, <clears throat> we recognize that initially there must be uh, new beta cells arising, the so-called embryological development of beta cells from precursors. And then <clears throat> once you have these beta cells, uh, they can reproduce, they can replicate, so they divide into new beta cells, and so one becomes two. And <clears throat> over time, there's uh, a balance between the number of cells being formed and the number of cells being lost. And so the idea is, hopefully, uh, if one is fortunate, you have sufficient number of beta cells, and any that are lost are replaced. Uh, in childhood, <clears throat> in humans, uh, there is an interesting pattern of growth of beta cells. We're all born with about 100 milligrams of beta cells, or if you prefer, uh, about 180 million cells. And then during the first five years of life, there's this rapid increase in the number of cells. So when you're first born, you have uh, about 100 milligrams of beta cells. By the time you're five, you've caught, you're, you're up to maybe 600 milligrams of beta cells, a six-fold increase. So a tremendous period of growth just after you were first born. And uh, <clears throat> this is uh, interesting because by the time you reach your teenage years here, those of you who have teenagers in the house know that you put 10,000 calories a, a day into the refrigerator and you come back the next day and they're gone and your teenagers are consuming vast amounts of food and growing very fast. While they're growing fast, the number of beta cells actually are not increasing. They're, by then they've plateaued and so the number of these cells that control your, <coughs> your blood sugar uh, pretty much stopped growing in number to a large extent by the time you're about five. So it probably explains why we see quite a lot of diabetes, type one and increasingly type two diabetes at this age of, of teenage life because there's an increased demand in growth at the same time as there's not particularly large numbers of cells being formed. If I show you the number of cells being formed in humans over time, uh, this next slide shows that and you can see the number of cells here increasing uh, during the first couple of years of life is very, very large compared to in later adult life. This shows the, the percent increase in the number of cells you're making. So all the action for growing your beta cells occurs during that first two years of life. And it's probably important for a number of reasons. We increasingly realize that there's some variance between us as to how many cells we actually make. Uh, and that probably dep depends to some extent upon the maternal environment, to some extent upon uh, childhood, what we get to eat, and, and, and the uh, circumstance of childhood. There's some genetic uh, imprinting. And maybe um, there is perhaps an increased risk of autoimmunity being set up during a time when there's so much going on in the endocrine islet, so many cells dividing, uh, that perhaps increases the exposure uh, of some of the cell surface proteins that might induce uh, autoimmune disease. So <clears throat> if the pattern of growth is shown in a cartoon form here, we can show you that there is a, <coughs> a, a gradual 
uh, formation of beta cells during early embryonic life that you'll, you'll hear more about again later. This rapid period of growth during the first years after birth, particularly during the first two years. And then we reach a, a relative steady state in health. The number of beta cells that we have stays rather flat during adult life, unless, of course, you're unlucky enough to develop diabetes and be losing these. And that can be illustrated in terms of the replication rate here, showing that the duplication of existing beta cells increases dramatically in the period what years one to two after, after you're born. And then this quiets down in humans to being almost nil by the time one's, say, 20 years of age. And this is important because, unfortunately, mice and rats is really quite different to this. Mice and rats have a much greater capacity for beta cell replication through most of their life. And so as, as models, we have to bear in mind that they're different. And perhaps one of the reasons there are so many cures of diabetes in mice is because this replication curve in mice stays much higher. And so there's a better capacity for them to make new beta cells, at least from that source. But <clears throat> the question perhaps we're interested in collectively, because we're interested in type 1 diabetes, is what is the capacity of any to make new beta cells here after the age of five. Most of my patients are more than five years of age. Can we uh, make new beta cells? We, do we have the capacity to repair the damage? So <clears throat> to simplify this into a little cartoon form, uh, we can think of the number of beta cells that one has being a composite of these new cells that are forming. If they, once you have cells, they can divide, and the cells uh, in turn uh, may die, and the, the balance is the balance between formation and loss. In <clears throat> adult humans, there seems to be very little capacity for beta cell replication. So the question is, uh, is there new beta cell formation in those of us who've gone past the age of five, at least age-wise, if not mentally? So <clears throat> here's the question marks that we were interested in, because it's obviously of relevance. Can, is there a capacity to generate new beta cells in adult humans? One of, the where, one of the circumstances in which it had been reported that there is new beta cells formed in animal models um, is in pregnancy. During pregnancy, the mother becomes quite insulin resistant during the third trimester. And that's important because if you're a mum and you're eating your lunch, you want the baby to grow faster than you do. If you grew at the same proportionate speed as the baby, you'd be a very unhappy mother. Uh, and so the idea is to divert the calories to the mother, for, from mother to baby. And to, do, to engineer this, mom becomes quite insulin resistant. Um, that means her beta cells have to work much harder. And in mice, at least, there's an expansion in the number of beta cells during pregnancy. But of course, mice are different from humans. We looked at this <coughs> in humans. Again, obviously, uh, it's a sad circumstance for us to be able to do this. These are, means, these are humans that tragically died during pregnancy where we could get the pancreas. And this shows you now sections of pancreas from humans. The top two sections are what we call low power. It's looking at it from the distance so that you can see the blue material here is the exocrine tissue, that tissue that's helping to release enzymes right now to digest your lunch. The purple uh, splodges here are these islets of Langerhans stain for insulin. And then lower, higher power, in the, excuse me, high power in the bottom here uh, shows you an islet uh, more easily discernible where the microscope is looking at it a bit more expanded. And <clears throat> this is a non-diabetic individual, low power and high power, and these are two, excuse me, non-diabetic, non-pregnant individuals, and these are two individuals who don't have diabetes and are pregnant 20 weeks and 22 weeks of gestation. And <clears throat> when we evaluated these pancreases, what we found was that there was no expansion in the size of the islets in women who were pregnant. Rather, if you look carefully, you might be able to discern that there's more of uh, these purple spots over here than on this side, more here than here. It seemed as though there were actually were new islets, little baby new islets appeared during pregnancy. Well, that's good news in the sense that it means then that adult humans are able to make islets. It's different from mice, again, because mice tend to expand the size of the islets rather than make new ones. But at least <clears throat> there seemed to be an increase in the number of cells so there is a capacity in <coughs> adult humans, uh, illustrated by this and some other studies, to make new beta cells. So <coughs> coming back to our cartoon, the <coughs> notion then is that 
we think that there is a, an ability to make new beta cells in adult life. That <coughs> the question then arises, um, if that's the case, why do people with type 1 diabetes not make new beta cells and reverse the loss of their, th th their cells? Why not just cure it? You know, you cut yourself, you have a hole, you fall off your bicycle. I think there's a hole there. I can't show it to you. But anyway, you end up with a big scratch. It heals. So if you're losing pancreatic beta cells, the cells that make insulin, why not just make new ones? So <clears throat> this shows you that, in fact, interestingly, this is an islet in the top panel from a patient who doesn't have, type, doesn't have diabetes, the normal pancreatic islet stained for insulin with about 2,000 2, 2, beta cells. This shows you an islet in someone who had type 1 diabetes for 30 years. When we look carefully at pancreases of people who've had type 1 diabetes a long time, um, it's interesting, almost every single pancreas, when we look at them, we will find uh, pancreatic beta cells. Uh, this happens to be more than, than usual. This shows you <coughs> um, uh, uh, more beta cells than typical, but we invariably find beta cells in the islets of people with type 1 diabetes. So that are these new beta cells that are being formed, or are these somehow cells that, when the diabetes occurred 30 years ago, were resilient and the cells here died, but these ones hung around and managed to stay. It's an important distinction because on the one hand, maybe there's ongoing new cell formation, or it may just be that somehow the autoimmune destruction stopped short of killing every single cell and left a few behind. To address that, <coughs> if you look carefully at these same uh, tissues in humans, what we find stained here by now green are pancreatic beta cells in a patient who's had type 1 diabetes Again, this patient was 26 years diabetic. The green are beta cells, blue are the glucagon secreting cells, the alpha cells, and red here are T lymphocytes. These are the, the, the cells that invade the islet during autoimmunity and seem to cause harm. So <clears throat> what Uris Meyer did when he was working with us in our lab, he showed that in fact in these people who have long-standing type 1 diabetes and still have uh, pancreatic beta cells, he was able to measure that they do have an increased rate of cell death. They're dying more quickly than ordinarily they should do, and that there's an infl inflammation in them. So that really answered the question, are these long-lasting cells that have been around forever, or are people with type 1 diabetes still making new cells? And clearly, uh, from Uris' uh, work, the answer was this, the second. They're making new cells, but the analogy I make is imagine you've got a bucket, and you have a hole in the bottom of the bucket, Water's flowing out because you've got a hole. You, keep, you get a hose pipe and try and fill it. Well, you have a hole, unfortunately, you keep losing the water. So these data suggest that people with long-standing type 1 diabetes are still trying to make, heal that, uh, that islet deficiency of cells, but the uh, <coughs> immune system is still targeting the cells that are made uh, and getting rid of them. So one of the questions we always get asked when we present this kind of finding is, well, okay, I'm... 70 years old, I've had type 1 diabetes 30 years. Am I still making new beta cells? How long is this, this process? Does this only occur during the first few years of life? Or does this, this capacity peter out? Um, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> if our cartoon then is modified to address that question, the notion would be that in people with long-standing type 1 diabetes, they have beta cells, but they're continuing to be diminished, being, they're being destroyed, that there are new beta cells being formed, mainly from some source that isn't replicating beta cells, probably, because if you have very few cells left, you can hardly make new cells by dividing the ones that still exist. However, if you make new cells, maybe they have a capacity to divide. So both of these sources of input are possible. It's in, in humans, it's very hard to be precise because you can only get one autopsy. We don't go taking your pancreas at lots of different pancreas at different times. But this kind of pattern emerges. And then the notion, there's really two questions you know, that, that arise from this. One, how long do I go on making these new cells? And two, um, what is, how, how many of them are I making? Am I making just one cell every now and again? Or am I making bunches of them? If I'm making very few cells, then you could argue this isn't particularly exciting or important because if you uh, have an immunologist finally figure out how to stop the cells dying, put a finger in the bucket. If there's only one drop of water coming into the bucket every sort of every other day, well, maybe this is going to take forever to fill my bucket. 
Or if there's a lot of water flowing into the bucket and somebody plugs the hole, maybe you can recover the, the numbers of beta cells. So I think the key questions at this point is to try and get some idea on how fast this process is going in humans and not least of which is where are these cells coming from? What is the precursor pool? Uh, and I think those are two very active areas of investigation right now. But I'm going to finish you off with the, the question again, that, well, how long do I keep doing this for? With a, with a hopeful slide, this is a gentleman who passed away at the age of 82 years of age. And <coughs> he was a, a so-called Jocelyn Medallion medalist. That means he had type 1 diabetes for more than 50 years. Uh, this is sections of his pancreas uh, made available from the uh, NPOD program from <coughs> uh, run by Mark Atkinson, a wonderful program obtaining pancreas from folks who have uh, diabetes, new onset or long-standing to, to make these kinds of studies in. And what, <coughs> what you see stained again here in purple is this gentleman who's had type 1 diabetes for more than 50 years has quite an active process of cell formation and cell destruction when we measured it for cell death. <coughs> so um, I don't know how old is considered old, it changes as we age, we consider old getting different at each time point, but by most people's criteria, 82 is a pretty good age. So if at 82 there's still a capacity for generating new beta cells, then I consider that a pretty optimistic uh, finding. So <coughs> to summarize, we try to keep beta cells a long time in health. People with type 1 diabetes, as you're hearing and know about, a lot about, are losing those cells, they're accelerating the loss of them. Um, we try to repair that damage, um, but unfortunately, because the damage is occurring to a greater extent than the repair process, we end up with relatively few cells. So I will finally show you who really does all this work that I've just presented to you. It's a great team of youngsters with one old guy in the background who they send out to talk because they don't let him go in the lab. And uh, these are the folks who are trying to figure out these questions for you. So thank you for your attention.